Uh, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks again this morning that we could gather here to worship you. Lord, we thank you for the sunshine and, and that we could be here, Lord. So we ask for your blessing upon our time here this morning. We ask that your spirit would be with us and work among us. And Lord, uh, may all we say and do this morning glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I'd ask you to turn to your hymnals or look on the screen to hymn number 774. We will sing all three verses, and following that, we will turn over to hymn number 118. So let's sing, uh, when the roll is called upon yonder, 774, I'd ask that you would stand with me. Catch your breath. We'll turn over to hymn number 118 and sing His Name is Wonderful. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. This time we'll ask for the Aaron's family to come up here for some special music.
Thank you. At this time, we'll ask Leah to come up, as well as all the kids, to join her for the children's story. Good morning, Case and Janessa. Case, do you want to come sit by me? No? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> um, do you guys know what nursery rhymes are? Yeah? Did your mom ever tell you nursery rhymes? Have you guys ever heard of like Humpty Dumpty? Or Jack Be Nimble? What about Little Bo Peep? Do you know that nursery rhyme? Can you tell it to me? Do you think you know it? Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. <coughs> Leave them alone and they'll come home, wagging their tails behind them. So if you guys ever had sheep, do you think you, if they got lost, you can just leave them alone and they'll come home? That's probably not a good idea. What about like your dog? If he ran away, do you think he'll come home sometimes? Sometimes he does. Sometimes we have to go look for him though, huh? Yep. But leaving them to come home, I don't think that's very good advice. If you've ever had a flock of sheep and they wander off and got lost, you wouldn't just leave them alone and hope they would find their way back. No, of course not. 
you would go out and search for them until you found them, and you would bring them home. Did you know that sheep are one of the most frequently mentioned animals in the Bible? I searched the Bible and found more than 200 verses that mention sheep. Jesus quite often compared people to sheep. And Jesus said of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In our Bible reading today, we see that Jesus and his disciples have been working very hard. They had been traveling from town to town, teaching and preaching. The Bible tells us that they were so busy that they didn't even have a chance to eat. Jesus could see that they were tired, so he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they got in a boat and went away. So they got in a boat and went away by themselves to a quiet place. But guess what? When they got there, they looked out and saw a great crowd of people. It would have been easy thing for Jesus to say, you all go on your way, we are tired and need some rest. Come back some other time. But Jesus didn't do that. He looked at the crowd and said, he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What does moved with compassion mean? Does that mean he felt sorry for them? No, it means more than that. It means that when Jesus saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd, he was moved to action. Remember what Jesus said about himself? the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Leave them alone, and they'll come home, bringing their tails behind them. Not Jesus, not the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. All right, should we pray? God, thank you so much for sending Jesus to keep us on the right path. We ask that you be with us today and be with us during this church service. Be with us during this week and keep us safe. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can go sit down. At this time, we'll ask Darren to come up for the congregational prayer. Okay, uh, you all have uh, a prayer sheet in your bulletin. Uh, we can remember those uh, in your daily prayers. Um, just a couple to remind you of the vote and the business meeting coming up um, today after uh, the service. And um, so just keep them, uh, keep that in your prayers. Uh, but um, let's... Um, uh, go to the time. Go go to the Lord uh, in a quiet time, and then I will lead out uh, in our prayer. We come to you this morning hour thanking you that uh, you are a God who loves and cares for us. And Lord, uh, you have a plan for each one of our lives, and uh, we praise you for it. Uh, we praise how you um, have been there uh, for us, and uh, through the good times and bad times, we can always rely uh, on your comforting hand, and we thank you. Lord, we have many requests to lift to you today, and uh, we know that you are a God who hears our prayers, uh, and you answer them and in your own time and in your own way, and uh, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, um, we want to uplift uh, those on our list um, who've been hurting, uh, those who've been sick. Uh, we want to remember um, 
little Briley Johnson and Bentley Bosch as they uh, continue to uh, heal. Lord, their young bodies, um, have they fought off uh, the sicknesses they had, and we thank you that um, you were there for them, for their families. Um, what a great treasure that is. Lord, we want to uphold those who've had surgeries in the past and uh, those who are on the mend. Uh, we know that your healing hand uh, has been upon them, and uh, Lord, we just praise you for the progress uh, that has been made. We want to uplift um, our church today as uh, we'll be voting on a pastor. I just pray that uh, uh, we would uh, seek out your wisdom and seek out your your face as we uh, make the decisions, uh, and may they be uh, glorifying to you. Lord, we want to uphold our congregation and um, all those who uh, come to worship here. We just thank you for them, and uh, those who serve on various boards or committees. We know that uh, it takes uh, a lot of people to uh, to help uh, this church function, and uh, we thank you. Lord, we want to uplift uh, our missionaries. Uh, we especially think of Dawn Siemens as she uh, uh, has COVID and as she has a broken leg. Lord, just uh, be near unto her and help her to heal. We think of Nancy Palmer and uh, Lord, uh, the cancer that she had uh, in her eye that was removed, we just uh, Pray for your continuing uh, healing and comfort there also. And we want to uplift uh, the missionaries even in our own country uh, who are out uh, uh, telling others about Christ. Uh, we just pray that uh, you would keep them safe. Um, even our missionaries uh, in other parts of the world that might be in harm's way, Lord, may... Uh, May you be near unto them, and may they feel your presence on this day. Lord, um, we just want to praise you this past week for the rain that you sent. Uh, Lord, how, um, how we were in uh, need uh, of moisture, and uh, we just thank you that the crops uh, are looking good and continuing uh, towards maturity. and. Uh, we praise you already for the crop uh, that will be harvested this fall. Lord, uh, as we think of um, our weekly activities that uh, are coming up, um, we especially want to remember our youth, and we think of Jesse and Brianna as they continue to, to lead uh, on Wednesday nights, Lord. Uh, I just pray that you would uh, uh, continue to be near unto them and give them uh, the words to speak as they uh, reach out to these young people. Now, Lord, uh, as we think of our service this morning, uh, we just pray for your continued uh, guidance uh, throughout it. We pray for Dallas as he brings forth uh, the message this morning. May uh, we have hearts and ears to hear uh, uh, what, uh, what you are saying through him, and may your spirit have the freedom uh, to move this morning that uh, we might heed uh, the words that we hear. Oh Lord, we're just so thankful that, um, that we can gather together uh, and uphold uh, one another. Now Lord, we just pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. At this time, uh, I'll have the ushers uh, come forward as uh, we take our morning offering.
and I would ask you you'd stand with me for the doxology. you pray with me. Lord, we give you thanks again that we could come here to worship you and through part of our worship that we would be able to give. Lord, we just thank you for the missionaries that are willing to serve around this country and around this world, even as a special emphasis on the United States this week and this month. Lord, we thank you for all of them. Lord, so Lord, as we have given these gifts, we pray that you would multiply them and bless them and that you'd also bless each giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I just like this special thanks to all of our pianists and organists for playing. Uh, just adds a special emphasis on our worship service this morning. So a special thank you to all of them. And at this time, I'd like to call Dallas to the pulpit again. He is no stranger to most of you anymore. And so I just uh, ask that he would be able to share what the Lord has led upon his heart. Yeah, I was here uh, first couple of weeks in June and uh, had some other things, and you guys had some other things, and so uh, a little bit of a break, and now I'm back for a few weeks, I guess, and uh, good to see you. You have to remind me of your names sometimes, but uh, glad to be here. I'd like to pray before I speak, so if you bow your heads again. Lord, I pray for your grace on the message that this will be faithful to your word and to the truth that is in your word. And I pray that um, we will hear with our hearts as well as our ears and let the seeds of the gospel be firmly planted and take root and produce fruit in our lives. That will be for your honor and glory. I pray this for your name, Lord. Amen. Well, I, uh, I like having props sometimes, so I'm just going to come down front for a little bit here. I borrowed these from your kitchen. That's why I was laid up front. Um, we've all been part of surprise parties at some point in our lives, yeah? Usually it's for birthdays. Um, I've had one and it was a lot of fun. And you know how surprise parties go, that usually the, uh, the host or hostess will invite a bunch of friends and family together and you will hide in the house or wherever that party's gonna be held and the honored guest comes in and you all stand up and say surprise and uh, hopefully nobody spoiled that and leaked the information ahead of time or nobody figured it out so you, you pass out the the plates and the forks and you have cake and ice cream and and uh, it's always a good time now what we're going to talk about this morning is a reverse surprise party because somebody was throwing a dinner party for some invited guests and everybody came, everybody showed up and uh, they were starting to eat and then an uninvited guest showed up and so the surprise was on the host who did not expect this development and the story is told in Luke chapter 7 so if you have your Bible Chapter 7, verse 36. I'm going to start reading there. And now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. I'm going to stop there. This itself is surprising because by and large, the vast majority of the Pharisees did not get along with Jesus. He rubbed them the wrong way. In their eyes, Jesus could not do or say anything right. And if you look back in the previous chapters in Luke, starting in chapter 5, you start seeing the rub here. There's one story in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus is in a house teaching, 
And it, it says, usually happened when he was around, there's a crowd. And there were some friends that knew Jesus was in the house. And they knew that he had this reputation for healing people. And they had a friend who was paralyzed. And so they wanted to get their friend to Jesus so he could be healed. But because of the crowd, and you probably heard this story in Sunday school years ago, they cut a hole in the roof. <laughs> um, which is a little bit easier in those days because they, they were not you know, made out of two by fours and, and shingles and all that kind of stuff. But they cut a hole in the roof and they let this friend down in front of Jesus, who I'm sure is astounded to see this guy coming through the hole in the roof. And Jesus says something that is surprising. He, instead of saying, you're healed, the first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees who are there, they start turning to each other and they start mumbling and grumbling and say, who does this guy think he is? Only God has the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus, knowing what they're talking about, says, uh, okay, which is easier, to tell somebody their sins are forgiven or to heal them? Well, they're both easy to say, but unless you're God, neither is going to be accomplished. And he says, so you guys, the Pharisees, know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Be healed. And then the guy's paralysis leaves him, and he can walk out of there. Pharisees didn't like that. Blasphemy, they said. The next story in chapter 5, Jesus is out there ministering to people, out and about. And he comes across a guy in Matthew, he's named Levi. In the other Gospels, he is also named Matthew. He's a tax collector. Tax collectors are the scum of the earth in the Jews' eyes because they work for the Romans who are running the country, oppressing the country, and collecting excessive taxes from the people. But Jesus tells us, Levi, this Matthew, come be one of my disciples. And the Pharisees say to the disciples of Jesus, why does your rabbi, your teacher, your master hang around with tax collectors and sinners? Shouldn't do that. I'm cutting out. Is there a reason for that? We don't know. Maybe you got a seven second button and you're bleeping me out once in a while. But anyway, you're not supposed to hang around with tax collectors and sinners. Luke chapter 6, the next chapter, tells the story of Jesus on the Sabbath day. He and the disciples are going from one place to another, and they're going across a grain field. And they're hungry. So, they take some heads of grain, and they rub them in the palms of their hands to shell them and they eat the grain and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law see that says oh you're not supposed to do that it's a Sabbath and that's work didn't like that by the way anybody ever do that I was on a combine crew years ago uh, working my way up from the south and you know we didn't have small grain except for some oats in our farm and yeah that's how you eat wheat or test it you just rub it, palms of your hands, and it shells it, and check it out. It tastes just like Wheaties. Amazing. Another story right after that. Luke chapter 6, another Sabbath day. Jesus is in the synagogue. And there's a man in the synagogue who has a shriveled hand. Jesus sees it. And he looks around, and he knows there's some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes that are there. And he says, you know, which is right, to heal on the Sabbath or not? And Jesus knew what their answer was, which is don't heal. And Jesus says, extend your hand, the man's hand, which is healed. 
And it says the Pharisees were furious. Should I grab another microphone or just use this maybe? Let's just use this. Let's do that. Okay. All right, we'll try this one. We're up to speed. So they're furious with Jesus. And that's what makes it surprising to me that this Pharisee, for whatever reason, and Luke doesn't explain why he invited Jesus, so we'll just leave it there. He invites Jesus to come to a dinner party that this Pharisee is throwing for some other friends. And that's a good thing. Because good things can happen when you get together with other people. Even people who are considered on the other side of the fence, people who are considered outside your loop, outside your, your circle of friends. I, I touch this next point very lightly because it can be a hot button, but it's obvious that in our country these days there's a lot of polarization for whatever reason. And, and, and people are in this camp or in this camp and they're throwing rocks at each other and nothing's getting resolved. But before we start pointing the fingers at people in <laughs> Washington or you can say your own state capital or whatever, on the political side, before we start pointing fingers at them, let's just take things home here to George, Iowa, and let's admit that it's not, it doesn't even have to be political stuff. It can be other stuff that we disagree with. Maybe it's sports. You know, some people get so uh, fanatical about sports. You, can, you know, if you got this team and they have that team, you can, you can start a heated argument right there. Or work, you know. Assuming you're not a farmer and you just take care of your own stuff, you have to work with people, whatever it is, and there can be disagreements about how you do things. Or there can be differences of opinion in your family about, well, what should we do about this or that? There can be differences of opinion in a church. But things don't get resolved unless you get together. You have to get together, and that's what's happening here with Jesus and this Pharisee. We're going to get together, and, and I think that's a good point, that it behooves us not to remain isolated, not to remain separated, not to keep our distance from other people. Things don't get changed. Things don't get resolved. So. This Pharisee invites Jesus to have dinner with him, and Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Getting together to eat is a really good way to start finding some common ground and to try and build bridges that would otherwise separate you. And I'll go back to Luke again in chapter 5 when Jesus called Levi or Matthew to be one of his disciples, one of his followers. What's the first thing Matthew did? He says, well, Jesus, let's get together with some of my friends, the other tax collectors, and let's, uh, let's have dinner. And Jesus went. Good way to get to know each other. When Jesus met Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, and again, tax collectors are considered the scum of the earth, they're considered the outsiders, they're the garbage in Jewish culture. When Jesus met Zacchaeus, what was the first thing Jesus said to him? Hey, I'm inviting myself over to your house for some coffee. Good way to establish relationships. 
And the apostles in the New Testament repeatedly encourage us to extend hospitality. Paul wrote to the Romans, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Peter wrote, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Don't complain when you do it. John wrote this, we ought therefore to show hospitality to such men, talking about the itinerant teachers going around, so we can work together for the truth. Hospitality, sharing meals, opening up your home. It's a good way to build relationships. And it's not just for something to do to get together with our friends. That's the easy thing to do. That's the common thing to do, and that's okay. But let's get beyond our comfort zone. Let's get outside our circle. This is what Jesus said, again from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. It says, when you have or give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Invite those you don't hang around with. And, and I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 6 to say, even the people you don't get along with, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And I might say, invite them over for dinner, lunch, for coffee. And again, when I think about the polarization and the divisions in our nation, you know, and again, politically, it's just mm, this side, this side, and there's nothing in here. In my lifetime, and I'm not real old, <laughs> but in my lifetime, I know, because I like to read the news and I like reading history and all this stuff, there have been times when the president's and the congressmen and congresswomen have argued and debated and had their disagreements in front of the news cameras. Yeah, well, we should be doing this. And the other side says, no, we should be doing that. And then at supper time, they got together. And they would laugh and they would joke and they would figure out, how do we figure this out? How do we resolve our differences? You want to do it this way, I'm going to do it that way. Let's meet here somewhere in between. And they did it. And unfortunately, this is one of those times in our nation's government when it's not happening. I blame both sides for that. But to take it home again, when we have these differences with people, whether it's in our family, our church, our school, our community, whatever it is, the wrong thing to do is to stand over here and to stand over there and throw rocks at each other and yell at each other. Nothing gets done. Nothing changes. Nothing's resolved. So I think we can learn something here from this Pharisee and from Jesus who the Pharisee invites Jesus and Jesus accepts. Invite people. Show hospitality. And I know, again, in my lifetime, it seems like having people over at your house is something that's kind of disappeared, and now we're more likely to invite somebody out. That's fine. If you want to go out to a cafe and have lunch, at least you're getting together, and you can talk, and you can listen. And listening. I'm going to read this verse in, in James. I don't have it on the outline, but my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, 
slow to speak and slow to become angry. Be quick to listen to the other side. And as I was thinking about how to, again, put, put this into practice, again, whether you invite them to your house for coffee or you invite them out to the coffee house and, and, and have something, take them to a drive-in for an ice cream cone. I suppose you can argue over an ice cream cone, but I, I've never seen it done, unless maybe it's two kids that said, I want one of yours. But if you're standing there with an ice cream cone, licking an ice cream cone, it's going to be real hard to, <laughs> to yell at a person, isn't it? You can smile at that thought. I love ice cream, by the way. Getting together to talk and to listen. And now here comes the surprise. Everything's working out fine at this point. This Pharisee has his friends over, he has Jesus over, they're having whatever for their dinner, for their meal. And then somebody shows up who's not invited. A woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Somehow she gets in there. I don't know, the door was open, maybe she knew one of the servants, but she gets in there and she does things that are surprising. The first of all is just going there because she had to know she's not welcome. And again from Luke's Gospel, as I mentioned before in chapter 5 when Jesus went with Matthew to his house to have dinner with his other tax collector friends, the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, why does Jesus hang around with tax collectors and sinners? We don't do that. Chapter 7, when Jesus again is hanging around with these people that are considered beneath the religious, they call Jesus a glutton and a drunkard because he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And this woman's a sinner in everybody's eyes. And they're about to label her as such as we will probably look at this in the coming weeks. But to go someplace where you're not invited, to go someplace where you're not welcome, that takes some bravery. I've got teams that I cheer for. You know, when I went to high school in such and such a town, I don't even want to bring it up because maybe you say, well, you went to that school. I went to college in another place. And you know, you got your rivals, and sometimes when you go to these rivals' places, uh, you're not exactly welcome. You might be tolerated, and you might even be despised. Uh, again, not naming names, but the college I went to had a real intense rivalry with another school, and it could get nasty. <laughs> to go to an away game wearing the visiting team sweatshirt and cheering for them, um, you might be inviting a fight. This woman went to a house she was not welcomed at, and that's a brave thing for her to do. So that's surprising she would show up. And then she does things that are surprising when she is there. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping again when they eat dinner in those days, he had a low table that you would recline at, so his feet are extended out behind him. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. An alabaster jar of perfume was expensive. This cost her. Something valuable that she gave as an offering, a sacrificial gift. And she weeps. Wow. Hmm. She's standing there and the tears are falling on his feet. And then she gets down on her knees and starts wiping the tears off his feet with her hair. And pours the perfume on his feet. That's humbling. 
You're familiar with the story in John where on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples are sitting around waiting for the supper to be served and Jesus gets up and he takes off his outer garments, he wraps a towel around himself and he starts washing the disciples' feet. And you know, Peter says, no, Lord, you can't do that. And Jesus basically said, yeah, well, somebody needed to do it. And you guys weren't willing to do it. You were not willing to be humble and serve each other. So I will do that. To teach you a lesson that you should serve each other. You should humble each other. Humble yourselves before each other. And do things that you might think are beneath you or so unimportant that you can't get down on your knees and do it. And this woman not only washes Jesus' feet, but she does it with her tears, and she doesn't have a towel with her, so then she takes her hair. And she pours the perfume on Jesus' feet. Humility. You know, in our stoic culture in the Midwest, most of us are coming from somewhere in Northern Europe, you know, we're pretty well buttoned up, you know? We don't, we don't like to cry too much, especially guys. And, uh, you know, we, we just don't like to express our emotions a whole lot. But I want to emphasize this lady's humility. That she was willing to, to put herself out there, to go to a place where she wasn't welcome, to give a gift that was very sacrificial, to humble herself and, and wiping Jesus' dirty feet with her tears in her hair. To say, you know, humility is a beautiful thing in God's eyes. And it says in James and in Peter, which is a quote from Proverbs, God opposes the proud, or some translations will say he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We need to be humble. Anytime, every time, whatever the circumstance, we should be humble. And God loves that. There should be no such thing as an arrogant Christian. That's an oxymoron, kind of like saying something's pretty ugly. That's an oxymoron. Or saying something is awfully good. That's an oxymoron. Arrogant Christian is an oxymoron. If you're a Christian, you should be humble. So, there's going to be somebody in this world that rubs us the wrong way. Church, family, work, school. And we, we can't figure out how they can be so bullheaded not to see things our way. Well, bullheadedness goes both ways. But when we find ourselves with differences of opinions on this or that, whatever it is, the wrong thing to do is to stay away from them. You should try to resolve things. Try and find a solution. Get together with them and listen to their side. Maybe they got some good points. Take the opportunity to be in a conversation where hopefully the, the volume doesn't get above this point. And a good way to get together to mend those tears in a relationship, a way to build the bridge and the gap is to eat together, have coffee together, buy a couple of ice cream cones and lick them and talk and listen. Being a follower of Jesus will be costly because we have to surrender our comfort zone and go to places and to be with people that we might not be comfortable with. We might have to sacrifice some things that are valuable to us. It doesn't have to be perfume. It can be something else that we have to give up or maybe not some thing, but some activity, some event that we says, well, okay, I'm not going to do that because I need to be here and do this. And we need to surrender our pride and our arrogance, and we need to be humble. 
and say, you know what? They might have a point there. So these are some of the things we need to do if we're going to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, a believer in him. And we will look, hopefully, God willing, in the coming weeks at more of this story. But uh, that's probably enough for us to chew on for today. So I'll pray. And uh, Kevin, if you, if you want to come up, let's stand for the benediction, please. And then we'll sing the bond of love, which is a good song for that. Lord, I pray again that this message will be uh, something we take to heart. It's going to be hard stuff, and the song we're going to sing is going to um, reiterate what should be a, a common desire for us that, uh, as you prayed, let them be one, Lord, even as we are one, that the world will know that you have sent me. That's what your prayer was, Jesus. So let us do this, even as we sing, let us sing from our hearts. I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. So let's sing the bond of love. It's number 423. Sing both verses. Thank Dallas for coming this morning, and we'd like to ask us if he goes up, he'd like to shake hands. Uh, for all members, we ask that you would stay, and all the non-members, you may be excused this time, and uh, we just thank you all for coming. Then we'll ask Alan to come up as he leads our business meeting.